Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much to all the other presenters. Um, your papers have been wonderful and I've enjoyed them immensely. And uh, thank you to um, Rebecca and the other members of uh, the Open Tour for organizing this conference and uh, inviting me here. It's been an immense pleasure and I'm very honored to be presenting my modest contribution to you today. Um, am I audible at the back, by the way? I, Okay, wonderful. Um, I am? Okay. Uh, is this better? This be okay, great. Okay, so my paper is entitled um, Paleohontological Lithophonics. Um, and exactly what that means will become clear over the course of this. Um, but what I'd like to start with is sort of summarizing um, a very interesting film for you. Um, it's called uh, The Stone Tape. It was a BBC Christmas special, a ghost story, um, directed by Nigel Neal. It was, um, or written by Nigel Neal, rather. It was um, released on Christmas in 1972, and it's this exceedingly interesting plot. Um, so the idea is that it's centered around this team of researchers working for an electronics and recording company. They're moving into a sort of Victorian-era mansion as their new facility. Um, and they're commissioned to work on new sort of recording technologies. Um, but the problem is that some of the workers refuse to install equipment in one of the rooms of the house from which they claim a, a sort of blood-curdling scream of a woman is emanating periodically. Um, so uh, what's hypothesized by one of the um, researchers, the, the leader of the research team actually, um, is that the stone in the room is itself acting <coughs> as a sort of recording mechanism. It's recording and replaying um, the sort of memory or event traces um, of the death of a maid um, in the room. And um, what's happening is the workers are sort of tapping into the right frequency um, and accessing these um, mnemic residues. Um, so the Researchers are obviously very excited by this because this is exactly the sort of technology that they're looking for. It, they just happen to stumble upon it. And so they attempt to perform various experiments on the room and apply their equipment to it. Um, but they're dreadfully unsuccessful. They can't pick up anything on their machines. And uh, I mean, what eventually happens is that they sort of push so hard um, on the room with their technology that the recording ends up being wiped away, it just vanishes. Um, so, um, it seems like the story is going to end here, but um, one of the researchers, the, the computer programmer, she realizes that actually there are hidden layers of recordings beneath the first one. It's just the first of multiple strata of recordings. Um, and she tries to, she's about to try to convince um, the other researchers of her findings, but um, the twist ending is that she dies in the room. and her last scream is is added to the rock as the new recording. So it's a lovely it's a lovely piece. Um, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah yeah. Happy holidays, everyone. Um, yeah yeah. Um, but so I, I think there are two elements of this that are particularly interesting. Um, the first is the relationship between matter and memory that's proposed and sort of novel hypothesis. And the second is um, the critique of instrumental reason that um, figures in this. Um, and um, I, I'm going to sort of articulate this partially through um, Mark Fisher's, uh, the late Mark Fisher's commentary on this. He was aware of this. He commented on it in some of his blog posts. And I, I think he included a section on Neil and um, the weird and the eerie. Um, but um, so first is the relationship between matter and memory. And I'm just going to quote myself here, quote my little description here. Um, the stone tape attests to the closeness of the relation between matter and memory. It is suggested that matter can act as a recording mechanism for events, which can then be subsequently broadcast out to human observers with access to the right frequency. There is an obvious sense in which matter and memory are related, since matter retains the influences of various activities upon it through its external appearance. And there's always the possibility that the events leading to the change in appearance can be reconstructed. So, so this is sort of similar to the protoplasm idea that was brought up a little bit ago. And I'm also reminded of a quote by Babbage in which he suggests that 
sort of impressions in the air can be, you know, sort of reasoned back to in, in this sort of Laplacian scenario. But um, anyway, um, however, the hypothesis advanced in stone tapes has something stronger. It is not merely that matter has memory in its external appearance, but that there is an invisible aspect of matter which records memories, another dimension of matter. The external appearance of matter masks a stratified dimension of mnemic residues. The idea brings to mind an analogy of Freud's, in which he characterizes in which he characterizes the unconscious as stratified, and the work of the psychoanalyst as involving the archaeological excavation of these layers. Um, thus, the concept of matter advanced is matter as a conduit of access to deep time. Matter essentially involves the stratification of events, the organization of human and non-human time scales, and the series of relative accessibility. Um, so, um, Mark Fisher um, notices the same pattern in um, several of um, Neil's works actually, including um, Quatermass in the Pit. Um, and I, I'll just pass over the quote there. Um, but so um, I'll quote for myself again here. Thus, matter should be understood not merely as a reservoir of mnemic residues, but as a conduit for the invasion of alien temporalities into our world. The ontological wager about the structure of time suggests that the now is not a moment in regular forward motion through linear time, but rather the convergence point of a bidirectionally executed attack, flanked by incurring forces from the past and the future, both seeking to break through the defenses of the present and form a temporal loop through the outside. The now is a circuit breaker. So that's sort of the essence of this um, matter memory approach. And what's interesting is that um, this idea that was put forth in the stone tape wasn't purely of Neil's own invention. It came from the work of an English archaeologist and parapsychological researcher of the time, T.C. Lethbridge. And he articulated this in a book of his called Ghost and Ghoul. Um, but um, Lethbridge sort of similarly held that through dousing methods, the use of pendulums um, to sort of tap into frequencies, um, we could access these hidden dimensions in which mnemic residues were stored. He had, the, he had this sort of super sensible um, um, plane that he posited. Um, but so moving on to the critique of instrumental reason that's sort of implicit in Neil, um, I want to contrast the approach of a parapsychologist like, um, like Lethbridge who's seeking to confer a mode of scientific res respectability onto the study of the occult with the actual approach of the scientists in the stone tape, which is much more reductionistic. So I'll read from this again. The parapsychological approach to haunting aims to confer the same manner of public respectability and methodological rigor which characterizes the physical sciences onto the study of the paranormal without as a consequence collapsing the paranormal into the physical. However, in stone tape, the approach of the scientists is crucially different. Um, they attempt to make a reductionistic analysis of the effects of the stone tape, grasping its essence technologically as a recording mechanism and submitting it to a battery of tests from their equipment. The scientists tried to reduce the haunting event to something techno-commercially exploitable and commodifiable, entirely ignoring its occult importance, ensuring their misunderstanding. The power of technology is to re-establish contact with the past and the non-linear acceleration of techno-economic feedback leads to ever-increasing complicity between the future and the past. Technology also possesses the ability to excavate the retentive mnemic strata of matter, destroying the linear sequence of events, ordering and reordering them in ever-tightening patterns of non-linear complexity. However, this capacity of technology is not equal to a domestication of the material. Thus, in stone tape, when the outermost recording on the stone is accidentally wiped, this only serves to let loose the far more dangerous forces which lay dormant underneath. Stone tape thus serves as a case study in the failure of instrumental reason and the dangers of excessive confidence in scientific explication. So there's this dual aspect of the matter memory hypothesis and the critique of instrumental reason, which um, holds massive possibilities for the occult, I would maintain. Um, but so it's at this point that I want to bring up the connection between Fisher's hauntology, Fisher's provision of hauntology, and speculative realism, um, which I, I think is a sort of um, neglected area of complicity, the one that's you know, um, I imminent throughout the work of both schools. Um, so in, in both cases, there's this central concern with the occult and the outside that needs to be explicated. And I, I think the best figure to sort of hone in on um, to explain the relation between the ontological 
and speculative realism would be Meisu, and in particular his article, The Spectral Dilemma, which I'll just sort of briefly summarize. So, um, in Spectral Dilemma, Meisu brings his logic of contingency to bear on the ontological problematic. Um, he observes the existence of what he calls essential specters, specters which sort of have endured deaths of such agony, such existential angst, such meaninglessness, um, that it, it seems almost impossible to mourn them. You can think of the deaths um, suffered in the atrocities of the 20th century, for example. Um, and essential mourning is just this sort of almost insuperable task of mourning the specters. So, so the, you know, there are sort of residences here almost with Derrida's task of messianic justice. It's just this ethically impossible task that we're confronted with. Um, so, Meisu's Meisu argues that neither the atheist nor the traditionally religious person can give sort of a due response to this, since the atheist, you know, he, he doesn't, the, the atheist is living in a sort of non-meaningful, contingent universe, um, whereas the religious person, he might hold out, he might hold out the possibility for God to perhaps resurrect these souls or, can, or sort of situate them in a broader plan um, but the religious person has to deal with the problem of evil. How, how, how can I justify these deaths, even if they do um, occupy some larger framework of um, uh, divine design? Um, so Mace rejects both of these options. He doesn't think they work. Um, what he proposes instead is that God does not exist now, but that God will come into existence, or God could come into existence. So God no longer exists, but God might come into existence. So God could, in the future, resurrect these souls and give them new meaning, um, but such a God would not be guilty of the crimes um, which brought the essential specters into existence in the first place, um, uh, since he didn't exist then. So it, it obviously seems quite odd for us to think that God could just come into existence. God is usually associated with the eternal and the atemporal. Um, but what Mayasu proposes is that um, he, he brings up the spec he brings up the speculative treatment of Hume's problem, um, the issue of the necessity of natural laws. Um, so Mayasu's gesture is to essentially reject any pre any pretense to a belief in the necessity of natural laws. What really reigns supreme is contingency. It's contingency that's really necessary. Um, so it's this. It, it, it's this absolutization of contingency that allows Meisu to posit a virtual divine, one that sort of is awaiting its coming to be. And this is what Meisu thinks allows us to hold out hope for um, essential specters and engage in the task of essential mourning. Um, and I'll quote Meisu, um, our task is more precise now. To resolve the reformulated Humean problem, we must refute such an inference from the contingency of laws to a frequent, even frenetic disorder, whether of matter or of representation. We must establish that the manifestability of laws does not demand that we maintain the necessity. And this is just what he does. Um, so um, there's, all, there's an obvious complicity between um, Fisher's ontology and um, Meisu's. Um, but I would argue that Fisher supersedes Meisu in some crucial respects by giving a real concrete method um, to what for Meisu is just sort of a modal hope. So I'll quote from here again. Fisher's ontology should be crucially allied with Meisu's speculative realism as its successful application to ontology strongly suggests, insofar as both are fundamentally oriented toward inhuman timescales. However, Fisher's work builds on Meisu's ontology giving an organized methodology to what was at first a mere dream, since what is modal for Meisu is material for Fisher. If Meisu crosses his fingers for the resurrection of lost souls, Fisher sets his, sets his sights on the exhumation of death, rushing headlong into annihilation. Fisher does not merely await a fortunate turn of radical contingency, he actively sets about excavating the quasi-numinal Nemo material strata which threaten to burst open, inviting an intrusion of the outside into our world, inviting the breakdown of our world. Thus, Fisher's ontology has the power to be more speculative realist than speculative realism itself, since as a specifically techno-political form of engagement, it not only adequately identifies the limitations of human cognition, but works toward the emancipatory destabilization of this very boundary. Um, and so it's here that I want to 
introduce the term paleoontology because I think paleoontology um, is sort of what concretizes um, these insights. So I'm going to say that the main insights of paleoontology are one, um, it's based on a specific kind of intensive materialism, a materialism based on a layered hierarchy of intensive strata, um, and the material strata in question are retentive, they're nemically retentive, insofar as their organization exhibits time scales. And the second aspect of paleoontology is that there's an alliance with the interests of speculative realism through the questioning of alien temporalities, so inhuman, non-human time scales, so questioning the limit, the temporal limits of the human. So, um, to sort of briefly, um, at the very end, get into the um, paleoontological lithophonics edition, I'm suggesting paleoontological lithophonics as a specific instance of the paleoontological. Um, a specific example where we might see how it works. So, um, and this is a specifically sonic example as well. So, um, it's been discovered that some of the stones um, used in the construction of Stonehenge possess acoustic properties. Um, they're what are called lithophones or ringing rocks. Um, they produce a sort of dull bell-like ringing that can be heard from a fairly wide radius. Um, and they're, I, I think the blanket term for them is blue stones. Um, but, so this lends a bit of insight to the question of, well, why, why were the stones at Stonehenge taken from so far away to build this monument? Why couldn't they just have used some of the stones lying about in the, near pro, in, in the available area? Well, it was, perhaps it was because these stones had a special spiritual significance because of their acoustic properties. Um, but the further question arises of why exactly um, why were these sounds significant? What exactly did they mean to the ancient Bretons who constructed the monument? Um, and I'm going to suggest that, in a sense, this is almost the wrong question, um, because we shouldn't seek to confer a specific meaning upon the sounds. You know, we shouldn't seek to reconstruct exactly what they meant to the Bretons. In, in fact, what sort of serves as the basis of our communion with the ancient Bretons is the uncanniness of the sound. Um, so it, the uncanny is a mystery both for the ancients and for modern scientists alike. Both of us are engaging in our specific modes of myth-making around the uncanniness of the sounds. Um, and I'm going to suggest that through this we can build a trans-temporal community of the outside. And this has excellent resonances, I think, with Fisher's what was going to be Fisher's final project before he passed away, um, his so-called acid communism. Um, and I'm going to take a brief quote, and I'll just wrap up with this, um, from an online essay um, by um, someone who goes under the moniker Xenogothic. Um, this is on the um, uh, Vast Abrupt website. Um, so, the cult represents the outside as a comprehensible and material social threat far more visibly dangerous than the misadventures of the atomized individual in their collective channeling of the powers of the great Cthulhu. Whatever horrifying and, unthink and unthinkable form the outside may take, the fact remains that it is seemingly through community alone that its effects can be harnessed, whilst nonetheless remaining intolerable to the individual human mind. So the kind of community I have in mind is an occult immersion into the absolute imminence of the outside. And I hope that you'll join me in celebrating this uh, the uh, instantiation of um, acid communism at Stonehenge. So, uh, thank you very much.